It is Saturday, March the 16th, 2019. This is the Distant Peasant Podcast, and I am your host, Jeff Georgia. On today's show, truth crime story, the murder of Orlando Letelier. Oh, not a mystery, of course. We know exactly who did it and why. Explore who did it and why, as well as a foreign country struggling to uplift its people, democratically elected Marxism, American imperialism, very ambitious episode. But of course, like all episodes, today's show is brought to you by listeners like you, people who go to patreon.com slash dissident peasant patron marks right around 70 80 is the next milestone once we get to 80 the next goal after that will be of course 100 and there will be consequences good ones for hitting 100 before we kick off today's episode two brief notes of production before i forget i want to thank my friend natalie who has some connections to chile and also speaks spanish I, of course, have neither of those. Without her help, this episode would be not nearly as good as it is. And so I want to take the opportunity to say thank you to her for her help and friendship. Second thing, of course, relatedly, obviously I do not speak Spanish. There's going to be a fair bit of Spanish in this episode. I will do my best. I want to apologize in advance for any pronunciations that I bungle. I promise to do my best. So, how to murder someone in the middle of the morning in a Washington, D.C. suburb and get away with it? Obviously, this is not prescriptive advice, but about... What circumstances have to coalesce into perfect condition in order to make it possible to achieve such a crazy thing? Now, who you are, who you murder, how you murder them, all of these are incredibly important things to keep track of, need to be attended to with exact specificity. We're going to talk about all this and more, of course. Such a thing has happened, did happen, one wet Tuesday morning. September 21st, 1976, on Sheridan Circle in Washington, D.C. So, who you are. Now, in order to get away with murdering someone like this, you're going to need to be rich and powerful. Now, calm down. You're not going to need to be the richest and most powerful, or even probably in the top 100 worldwide. No, you're just going to need to be richer and more powerful than most everyone else in the world. So you will need to be probably one of the most powerful people in your own little corner of the earth. Say, the dictator. A moderately small nation of around 10 million people, as General Augusto Pinochet was in September 1976. Next, who you murder. Now, you do have some options here. As Pinochet murdered thousands of people, prisons and tortured tens of thousands more, drove hundreds of thousands into exile and ended up facing only house arrest as punishment for it all before he left this earth. However, if you want to do the deed in a Washington, D.C. suburb, you really need an angle so that Uncle Sam isn't too upset with you. So you choose an exiled member of the former democratically elected Marxist president you deposed, Orlando Letelier, a martyr and hero, in my opinion, and his 25-year-old American assistant and colleague, Ronnie Moffat, also a martyr and a hero. America in 1976 might not be accustomed to murders in their suburbs by bomb, but it is the late Cold War, so there were, and still are, frankly, plenty of slime balls willing to become apologists for such activities in the name of freedom, capitalism, which means it also helps to be incredibly friendly to American business interests, as an aside. Finally, how you murder them. Now, you can't very well personally fly to Washington yourself and shoot the guy or anything like that. No, you're going to need some cutouts. 
Michael Townley, U.S. born Chilean intelligence operative, organized the assassinations planning, meeting, and execution. He will eventually cough up some names that he used to help him do it and plenty of information in exchange for a plea bargain. And the fates of all of these men we will return to later. Let all glibness aside, who was this man Pinochet who ordered the death of Orlando Letelier? And who was this man that he went to such great lengths to kill him in such a brazen manner? Who were the men who let him get away with it and indeed probably even had prior knowledge of his plans. Why did they do this? Why did this all happen? Orlando Letelier was born the 13th of April, 1932, in Temuco, Chile. Temuco being a name from the indigenous Mapuche, meaning Timu water, Timu being the common name for two species of fruit-bearing trees native to the area. Now, Chile during this time is in a Pretty unstable era politically, with coups and the threat of coups, a thing of young Latelier's past, present, and future all at once. Although he was born in Temuco, he actually spent most of his childhood in Santiago, Chile's richer and larger capital. He had some higher education, but he isn't anything like we would consider an elite in his schooling as a young man. He completed secondary school at a military academy before abandoning that life, and then entered law school at the University of Chile. Notably, he served as a representative for the Chilean Students' Union until 1952. This was his first serious engagement with politics. And his union wasn't choosing just which punch to serve or that year's dance theme, but was actually one of the oldest and most active student unions on the entire continent. He was also the driving force behind the organization of the art and culture schools at the University of Chile, that is, the musicians, actors, and artists. He brought them together on interests they held in common, and I gotta tell you, Wrangling such people can be a tough job that only the best politicians are cut out for. He wasn't born of elite privilege or anything like that, though his sister would describe their family as pretty bourgeois. He was just a regular kind of dude in most ways. That is to say, not very important, until very suddenly he was. Another Pinochet victim from Tomoko, Pablo Neruda, one of the best stand poets humankind has ever produced in any language, and card-carrying communist to boot, actually joined Letelier in government prior to its coup, which we will get to, I promise. In 1955, he joined the newly created Copper Office in Chile, copper being the largest export from the country at the time and still clocking in at number two on the commodities chart last I checked. His job around this time was to study markets and find customers, even communist ones for the record, and settle terms for the sale of the most important of commodities to the Chilean economy, and one which at this point is partially nationalized, but with private companies retaining shares and still getting paid. In fact, when he was only 26, he did indeed sell a pretty good amount of copper to the Soviets on mutually agreeable terms, making 1958 a boom time for Chile, and himself a widely recognized expert in his field, despite his relative youth. In hindsight, he was perhaps too successful because he began to garner a lot of attention, he was fired, supposedly as part of a routine restructuring of his department, but probably for supporting the campaign of the loser socialist candidate that year, who will surely never amount to anything. After his firing, he picked up and left Chile altogether and headed for Caracas, the capital of Venezuela, where he worked in their finance ministry, as a copper consultant, of course. He was already married around this time with three kids. He would have four eventually, his wife Isabel, and he fell in love due to a shared love of music and theater. Wherever he laid his head at night, a piece of him still lay with Chile, I think it's fair to say. Letelier joined the Socialist Party of Chile in 1959. This party was recently unified with the previously straight-up outlawed Communist Party in Chile. Now, this party, though it did better in some years than others, wasn't able to take power in Chile for now, getting beaten by various center-left and center-right candidates in the 50s and 60s. While this is happening, Orlando went to Washington, D.C., worked at the Inter-American Development Bank, and studied at American University. Now, as far as this bank goes, I know its name does have a creepily neoliberal ring to it, and there were and are definitely some problematic strings attached to the loans coming out of said banks and other banks like it at times, but this was still fundamentally an institution ready to invest cold, hard cash 
in Chile's small but growing industrial sectors. For the first time, actually, agriculture ceased to be the primary productive sector of the Chilean economy starting in the 50s. Now, this institution continues to do its thing, and however socialist you are, investment is absolutely necessary to industrializing a country like Chile and raising the living standards of the people there. And Letelier doubtless understood this, which is why he was there, working at such a place, I think. He was actually so good at his job that when the Asian Development Bank was being formed, Letelier was one of the principal people consulted on the structuring of such an entity. He also made plenty of contacts and friends in Colombia, Venezuela, and Ecuador for his work in figuring out how to funnel investment from the Global North into South America. Of course, if all he ever did was sell copper, get loans finalized, however noble the ends to those pursuits, I wouldn't be here talking about him. Now, that three-time loser socialist presidential candidate, the same one Letelier had been fired from the copper office for supporting, despite being a rock star there, finally overcame the fickleness of liberals, the narcissism of leftists, the plots of American imperial officers and business interests, and just plain bad luck to finally stop losing, because in 1970, Salvador Allende became the president of Chile. We will return to the life of Orlando Letelier soon, but let's back up a bit. Now, representing a left coalition of socialist, communist, splinter Christian Democrats, this is no easy task for anyone, and Allende had lost the presidency three previous times. In an age when the most obvious and self-evident way to power was often not election but military coup, Allende's peaceful path to socialism annoyed more radical elements of his coalition, while still scaring away many a liberal capitalist. In response, Allende signed a pact that the Popular Unity Party, the name of his coalition, would share the administration of Chile and he would be super constitutional about everything. This, combined with the support of Pablo Neruda, the master poet and candidate for the very large Communist Party in Chile, ensured that after much hemming and hawing, he got the nomination. In the general election, he was opposed by both a center and right-wing candidate. The right-wing candidate, former President Alessandri Rodriguez, was considered the dominant favorite to win basically the entire election very easily. In fact, though the ITT Corporation, which had on its board CIA-connected members and participated in dozens of meetings with CIA officials about political conditions in Chile, did manage to funnel a few hundred thousand dollars to La Alessandri, but the American imperial apparatus was largely caught flat-footed. Alessandri, in fact, was getting pretty long in the tooth, was accused of having Parkinson's disease and being senile, and actually held no public rallies until the very end of the campaign in order to hide his deteriorating condition, all of which contributed to his second-place finish. In addition, during the election, the commander-in-chief of the Chilean army, who is not the same person as the president of Chile, was asked about how the army felt about its role if no candidate got a majority of votes. General Ney Schneider responded that the Chilean Congress should then vote among the top two winners, just as the Constitution provides, and the army should then just go with that, irritating right-wingers at the time who assumed they would win a plurality and by tradition be confirmed in the Congress. It was during the exchange that he actually ended up signing his own death warrant unwittingly. Now, obviously, Alessandri's presidency was not to be. Instead, Allende's ragtag group received the most votes of any candidate, 36.63%. The right-wing candidate took home 35.29, with a center Christian Democrat at 28.08. Confidence turned to ash in the mouths of plenty on Election Day, as fears of a socialist head of state intensified. Now, Election Day was incredibly tense, but peaceful. And for the record, it doesn't appear anyone stole the thing, either whatever squeals about fraud on the right you might hear. Now, like I said, according to the Constitution of Chile, if no candidate received an absolute majority of votes, the national legislature was directed to convene and choose the winner of the election from the highest two vote-getters. Chile had never taken the opportunity before of this to confirm anyone but the winner of the plurality of votes, but a little mini-red scare was attempted before Linde took office. 
driven in huge degree by the American government, an intense lobbying campaign began to convince the center and right wings of the Chilean Congress to confirm Alessandria as the winner, who would then immediately resign and call for new elections. Elections which former President Eduardo Frey, a much more palpable choice to them and constitutionally ineligible for a consecutive term like everyone else, was sure to win, they figured. Instead, Allende was able to assure everyone, notably the Christian Democrats, that he was bound by the Constitution in his quest to achieve Chilean socialism and confirmed by the Congress to be the President of Chile. President Richard Nixon was absolutely furious having previously ordered that an Allende presidency be avoided at all costs. And believe me, he meant it, because work began immediately on their Plan B, or Track 2, as they called it at the time, as opposed to Track 1, the effort by the United States government to unite Christian Democrats in the right in not confirming Allende. Now, Track 2 involved lots of things, but culminated in the execution of General Rene Schneider's proverbial death warrant the one he signed earlier. Of course, one obstacle in the way of any military coup to stop Allende was the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, who had previously indicated that he was indeed into the rule of law and constitutional government. Following two previous failures to kidnap him, CIA-connected elements of the Chilean military, growing increasingly disparate, tried one last time to kidnap the general while he was being driven to the Ministry of Defense in the morning, and they fucked it up. Schneider was packing heat and immediately drew his pistol in self-defense when they tried to pin his car in, firing at the kidnappers in the other car. His driver also began reaching for his own pistol in the glove box. Panicked, the kidnappers returned fire and ended up shooting General Schneider, who died before reaching the hospital. The Chilean people were absolutely outraged, and though it would take some time to review the detail and scope of these plans, American involvement was suspected by almost everyone immediately and was known for a fact by some. Among those who knew of that involvement, as a matter of fact, was Henry Kissinger. This operation that resulted in the murder of an innocent man was personally signed off on by him, and we know it for a fact. This is one reason, among many others, Kissinger is to this day wanted in custody in Chile, in connection for this and other human rights violations in Chile. In addition, the CIA did give guns, money, tear gas, gas masks, and other weapons and material to various groups in the conspiracy to kidnap the general, though this particular group didn't avail themselves of any of that material. What they did avail themselves of was $35,000 in cold, hard cash, paid for, it was said, humanitarian reasons, but in reality, hush money designed to keep their conspiracy a secret. In addition to all the campaign monies from earlier I talked about and some smaller spending and advice, rest assured, American imperial muckery in our story is not finished. Amongst this atmosphere, President Frey handed Allende the presidential tokens of office. Some researchers suspect that Frey, among others in the government at the time in the army, knew of the conspiracy against Allende and General Schneider. Before leaving office, it's a fact that he would oversee the favored placement of many members of the Schneider conspiracy. So, Allende is president. Now, I am neither an unbiased observer nor an economist with a deep knowledge of historical Chilean monetary and budgetary policy and will, by necessity, have to leave out much detail about Chilean economics and politics around this time, but I did look into this more than a little to give you the broad strokes. And I gotta say, Allende did a lot of good very, very quickly. Some of that good included a nationwide free milk program for the poor, increasing taxes on the rich, increasing the floor on taxable income, kicking Chilean land redistribution into high gear, shortening work hours and increasing pay for workers, massively increasing education spending, public works projects, and huge programs launched against illiteracy. But probably his biggest and most radical changes were regarding the nationalization of Chilean copper. Now, like I told you before, there was a state copper office and later corporation in the 50s. Letelier worked there, and we'll get back to him soon, I promise. But nationalization at the time meant a 51% share in the company for Chile, with foreign firms holding the rest and still making a tidy return for doing nothing but holding paper. 
All the while, Uncle Sam is more or less pointing a gun around the room, metaphorically speaking, and the shares being bought and sold rather than taken and kept. And one day in his government were, frankly, pretty sick and tired of this state of affairs, especially considering all they suspected and knew of American business and governmental hostility to even their peaceful path of socialism. So the new plan was, all the copper is Chile's now, and we will be paying you jackals zero dollars, and that's what we call fair. Same went for some other assets, too, of the ITT Corporation, after revelations of ITT's recent malfeasance with the CIA was revealed by the American press. Also active in funding right-wing politics and propaganda in the Chilean press for years. For the record, the 1971 congressional vote in Chile concerning copper nationalization was absolutely unanimous. And it was basically this vote and the resulting policy that Orlando Letelier, ambassador extraordinary and plenipotentiary to the United States of America from the Republic of Chile, spent a lot of his time defending and trying to execute. That's right, Orlando Letelier was named ambassador to the United States, this most important of positions in order to defend Chilean policies of nationalization. It was tough going for him. American business interests, especially in the copper that was and is one of Chile's largest and most important exports, the ITT Corporation and Pepsi, believe it or not, all united with the American government and explained the first part of their plan very succinctly in the words of a U.S. ambassador around this time. Quote, once Alinde comes to power, we shall do all within our power to condemn Chile and the Chileans to utmost deprivation and poverty, end quote. Nixon himself ordered his government to, quote, make the economy scream, end quote. The United States government reduced aid to Chile, and after promising economic and social results in the first year of his presidency, problems began to arise for Allende. Those problems were related to a closing off of American credit, as well as reduced aid during his presidency, and for all the scaremongering Kissinger and the American right did and still do about Olinde being a Soviet pawn, trade and aid with the Soviets was of a much lower volume and kind than the Chileans had hoped for. And almost all the credit extended to them from the Soviets was related to purchases made from the Soviets themselves. European banks were stingy in their lending as well, as American cold warriors leaned on them ever harder to deny the dastardly, if peaceful, Marxist head of state any successes. The worldwide price of copper also collapsed around this time, and in some sectors of the Chilean economy, there were losses in productivity as working hours were reduced and wages increased pretty drastically and quickly. Inflation began to kick into overdrive. GDP contracted severely. Price controls were introduced, which led to more black markets. All really tough stuff. There was actually a worldwide inflation crisis around this time, but that aside, it really was probably all avoidable in your host's humble opinion if the Americans hadn't done their best to make it happen. Letelier was doing his best to ameliorate all of this, of course, but as well as he knew his home country and his copper, there was more or less no budging he could make happen on any of this, though he did negotiate the nationalization of some U.S. firms in Chile with the Americans. President Allende recalled him in 1973. Not for doing a shitty job or anything, but to take the first of three different cabinet posts that year, some of which he served in for just a matter of weeks, as Olinde's coalition, never as homogenous and Marxist as some people would have you believe, began to fall apart. Is the United States directly responsible for the events that are going to take place next? Well, no. The operation in question wasn't American but Chilean, wasn't driven by the United States but by nationalist right-wing military officers in Chile, but, short of this, everything that's about to happen was indeed set up and encouraged by old Uncle Sam. The plumbing economy, the money pouring into counter Allende forces, the sharing of intelligence and networks. Without all the U.S. empire did to sow the seeds, no poisoned fruit like military dictatorship could ever have sprouted and flourished as it did. And the fruit of this tree will grow to kill many thousands of Chileans, including one Chilean carried by the wind to the United States itself. Now, this episode is not about everything that happened in the coup that took place September 11th, 1973, a coup that will eventually result in a relatively unknown general named Augusto Pinochet, 
thought to be loyal to Alinde to the very end, by the way, taking the opportunity to consolidate power over the other Chilean generals and become the nation's military dictator for the next 17 brutal years. But I will tell you what happened to Orlando. When he entered his office at the Ministry of Defense that morning, he was arrested. Actually, the first cabinet official detained and shipped off to a holding pen and then a series of prisons and concentration camps for months. Eight months of these were on Dawson Island, a remote little speck of land off the southern coast of Chile. He was tortured. Among other details I can find, he and other prisoners around him were incredibly ill-fed. Their tiny food portions often served to them on the ground. Sleep deprivation was an incredibly common tactic. Forced marches and labor were used a lot on prisoners. Mail was absolutely forbidden. He was subjected to electric shocks, beaten up a lot. I hasten to add that this is but a fraction of the many crimes against humanity the regime was busy perpetrating, and would perpetrate for years after this, not all of which falls within the scope of this episode, and some of which is quite dark. Anyway, after months of efforts by his friends and supporters on the outside, some of whom were relatively well-respected in Chile, his release was finally obtained in 1974. At the parting meeting between Letelier and his Chilean captors, he was told that Pinochet's arm was quite long and to watch his tongue, lest he need to watch his back. Well, Orlando Letelier didn't do that. Instead, after regrouping with his family in Venezuela, he headed back to the United States, where he testified and spoke out vociferously after his freedom with exile was granted and he returned to Washington, D.C., spoke out against Pinochet's brutal repression and against the neoliberal economic policies that were even then beginning to be cheered on by all the usual suspects. In reality, the rebounding Chilean economy, such as it was, had far more to do with the end of economic sabotage by the United States government than anything any credentialed neoliberal Chicago school dipshit ever did, a point Letelier made himself with much more panache at the time. He also did much to protest and encourage countries not to invest in Pinochet's neoliberal military dictatorship, as well as opposing Francisco Franco's regime in Spain, his dictatorship still a going concern at the time. I could go on and on about all this, but Orlando Letelier was a diplomat and a superb communicator. On September 10th, 1976, he gave what would be his final public speech on what he was fighting for and who he was fighting against. It isn't too long, and so I quote from it now. Dear friends of Chile, dear friends of the true Chile, in the name of our dead ones, in the name of more than 100,000 Chileans that have been put in the jails and concentration camps of the military dictatorship, of the thousands and thousands that have suffered brutal torture, of the families of those who have disappeared, murdered by the secret police, of the more than 200,000 Chileans who have been expelled from their country and now live in exile, of the millions of Chileans who have no jobs and who are starving under the criminal economic policy of the fascist junta, in the name of those who in Chile and abroad resist fascism and struggle for the restoration of democracy in our country, I bring here a message of gratitude to all of you. From the very moment that a group of generals serving the most reactionary economic groups decided three years ago to declare war against the Chilean people, to occupy our country, an impressive worldwide movement of solidarity with the Chilean people has emerged. This vast solidarity movement has expressed, from the most diverse ideological and political perspectives, the repulsion of the civilized world for the barbaric and brutal violation of all human rights by the Chilean military junta, during the past three years, the international support to the Chilean people by governments, political parties, churches, international organizations, humanitarian institutions, and persons of goodwill has saved countless numbers of lives and has liberated hundreds of political prisoners from the hands of the most repressive regime the world has known since the destruction of fascism and Nazism in Europe. This concert is a new demonstration of the fraternal reaction that the suffering of the Chilean people has brought about all over the world 
In this gathering tonight, there are many Chileans and Americans who have suffered imprisonment by the Chilean military dictatorship. There are many whose sons and daughters have been murdered by the Chilean fascists. If we were liberated, it was because of the international pressure on the military junta. It was because of your support and your efforts for the restoration of human rights in Chile. We have tonight with us several ambassadors representing governments from Europe, Asia, Africa, and Latin America. We are particularly pleased to have with us Ambassador Dean Bin T, a permanent observer to the United Nations of the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. To all of them, our appreciation. We also have here members of the National Council of Churches of the United States, representatives of the United Auto Workers, and several other labor unions, many community leaders, particularly of the black, Puerto Rican, and Chicano people, and representatives of Amnesty International that has played such an important role in obtaining the freedom of hundreds of Chilean political prisoners. Today, Pinochet has signed a decree in which it is said that I am deprived of my nationality. This is an important day for me, a dramatic day in my life, in which the action of the fascist generals against me makes me feel more Chilean than ever. Because we are the true Chileans, in the tradition of O'Higgins, Balmaceda, Allende, Naruto, Gabriela Mistral, Claudio Ara, and Victor Yara, and they, the fascists, are the enemies of Chile, the traitors who are selling our country to foreign interests. I was born a Chilean, I am a Chilean, and I will die a Chilean. They were born traitors, they live as traitors, and they will be known forever as fascist traitors. Three years ago, Salvador Allende died, defending democracy, our constitution, and the conquests of the Chilean people and their struggle for dignity, freedom, and socialism. We are not here today only to commemorate the death of a great hero of our country, but also to project his message into the future. The solidarity of the American people in favor of the restoration of human rights and democracy in Chile must continue to grow. This solidarity is paramount to us. We will never rest until we achieve the overthrow of the fascist regime in Chile. At that time, when we shall be building a new democracy, we will be counting on your support to uphold the hard-fought conquests of the Chilean people and to stop once and for all the reactionary forces that from within Chile and from abroad destroyed our democracy. The words of Salvador Allende have a stronger meaning now than ever before. In the final moments of his epic fight, he said, quote, I have faith in Chile and her destiny. Other men will overcome this dark and bitter moment where treason imposed itself. May you continue to know that much sooner than later, great avenues will open through which free men will pass to build a better society, end quote. Thank you very much. Eleven days later, his car exploded on the way to work, killing him and his American colleague, Ronnie Moffat, like I said, and wounding her recently newlywed husband, Michael. The State Department made concerned murmurs about the bombing, and that's it. Later investigations and disclosures would trace the bombing's planning to a Chilean intelligence operative and American expatriate named Michael Townley, who would eventually confess that he had recruited five anti-Castro Cuban exiles to execute the bombing. In exchange for this information, Townley pled guilty to one count of conspiracy to commit murder. He would ultimately serve only 62 months in prison for this murder before being released into the FBI's Witness Protection Program, where he remains to this day, now in his 70s. Of those he fingered who helped him do the bombing, three were originally found guilty of murder. All three were later acquitted in a new trial. Two others skipped town and lived as fugitives until the 90s, when they were finally apprehended. One would serve eight years in prison and then four out on probation in the custody of Immigration and Naturalization Services. The other served six years in prison before being paroled and then also delivered into the custody of the Immigration and Naturalization Service. In 2001, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that indefinite detentions in immigration and customs for prisoners destined for deportation to a country where no extradition treaty exists, Cuba in this case, is unconstitutional which is how both these men were released. Thus concludes the cases of every single person who ever saw the inside of a U.S. courtroom for this bombing. A bombing, it should be said, the United States Intelligence Services almost certainly had specific knowledge of. 
for at least a couple months before it happened. And if not specific knowledge, definitely had pretty broad signs that Chilean intelligence and secret police were about to try something like this. In fact, Operation Condor, the broader effort by several South American intelligence agencies to coordinate campaigns of terror and political repression across South America with either passive or active assistance from the American government, was actually planning on killing a United States congressperson after this named Edward Koch, a plot that the congressperson was only warned about after Orlando Letelier was assassinated. The man who gave Townley his marching orders was General Manuel Contreras, head of Pinochet's murderous intelligence agency and secret police service known as the DINA, who got his marching orders straight from Pinochet. And we do indeed know for a fact that it was Pinochet who personally wanted Letelier murdered. Chile, post-dictatorship, would finally nail Contreras for this murder, for which he did serve six years in prison though his time in court was far from over after this for the blood on his hands. As for Pinochet, as I said before, for this and his nearly countless other crimes, he would face only house arrest as justice, dying, before he could ever be convicted and sentenced to something else. Fernando Alegria, a distinguished Chilean poet and literary critic, wrote a poem called Elegy, to Orlando Letelier. It's in Spanish, of course, and poetry translates badly even on the tips of a skilled speaker's tongue. But in English, the beginning of the poem might go something like this, with due apologies to Dr. Alegria. Quote, Comrade, you found the righteous way when the pitfalls appeared. You saw the sunrise in the sky of our fatherland when fire became mingled with the red flowers of our spring. That fire nearly always spews from the barrel of an American gun, sometimes a literal gun, sometimes a metaphorical gun. Wherever Marxist or socialist ideas take hold in a country, American imperial interests take note and can be found. With the language of freedom and liberty on their lips, and dark words about the totalitarian nature of their opponents, what if those opponents are peaceful and democratic, though? What if their election is constitutional and their platform actually a compromise blending many non-socialist Christian democratic values and Marxist-infused ones as well? What if we promise over and over and over again to the libs that we aren't going to be Stalin, we promise, and then we do all we feasibly can do to live up to those promises while remaining true to our socialist vision? Without sounding too pessimistic, in the end, it didn't seem to matter. At least it didn't matter for Allende and Orlando Letelier, not as long as they were really committed to a different organization of society. However, it might really be the case that for something beautiful to grow, or at least something better to grow, like a government interested in improving the lives of its poorest and most forgotten citizens, the most important thing for you to do if your Uncle Sam is not to pour fire on the red flowers of spring. Thank you for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. If you didn't know anything about Chile or Salvador Allende, I think this podcast will give you a good place to start. I hope. A brief reminder, patreon.com slash distant peasant. That's how you support the show me slash distant peasant where you give me one time donations thank you very much to all my patrons and listeners really appreciate it see you